it's your girl Deshonda Carter, but you can call me DC. Thanks so much for tuning in today to my show, When the Blue Comes Off. Sit back, relax, take notes, do what you like, and let's get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my very special guest, none other than retired New York City Department of Corrections officer, Miss Sharon Nelson! Ooh, <laughs> I am getting so good at these introductions. I'm telling you, I could go work with NBA girl. I'm trying to tell you that was- out of your busy, busy, busy schedule to be a part of our family today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Welcome. So we're just going to jump right into it, Sharon. Okay. So you were New York City Department of Corrections officer, but what made you go into that line of work? Okay. Well, let me give you a little history. Um, I grew up in Harlem, and at the time I had two children that I needed to provide for. So I had three jobs. And from one to the other, I would go in it. I barely had time to really spend with my children. My best friend said, girl, start taking these city jobs. And she said, this way, you go into one job, you're going to retire, you're going to have a pension, and you can do whatever else you want to after that. But at least this way, you got something to fall back on. I said, okay. So I did it. Took the test past high scores and corrections called me the corrections test and the PD test was together corrections called me first so I started the process went into the academy and the rest is history here I am well you know I knew I liked you Sharon because you know I was born in Harlem Hospital my first job was the McDonald's on 132nd Atlantic Avenue Bull so you know Ah, Harlem girl okay okay and I also took that test that was uh, the PD and correction test. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that was the only test they ever had of that kind ever. They, mm-hmm. they never had another one with um, dual capacity. So now you took the test, you passed high, high scores. They call you for the correction academy. So a little bit back you, you, this wasn't a career that you were destined. This wasn't something I'm going to go being law enforcement. This was, nope, I need to provide for my family. So yes. I go in the academy now. What was that experience like for you? Like, was it what you thought it was going to be? Or just give us what your experience was. Uh, I, I didn't know what to expect. And um, I went in open-minded willing to learn whatever it was that I had to learn. Um, while in college, I um, I took the course, the physical education course, where they had you working out and different things like that. So I was always physical fit, physically fit. Mm-hmm. So I knew that wouldn't be a problem. And as I went in each day, I learned something new. Um, I was very happy with the instructors. They were um, very knowledgeable, and I enjoyed my time there. Well, I don't know about so many people saying they enjoyed their time there. Oh, no, actually, I think it was one of the chiefs uh, that I introduced, that I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, who, oh my God, I can't recall his name right now. This how this guy's will show that it's actually live. But I want to say he was one of my um, guests who went through the FBI Academy. And he was saying how um, he was so into the competition. And that's why Mm -hmm. he was, you know, loving the Academy. I just want you to know, I could care less. I didn't want to do no push-ups. I didn't want to run. I didn't want to do none of that. That's the part that I like. I like the push-ups because now I'm able to, you know, hold myself up longer than some of the guys i was good with that like okay okay. so i don't know sometimes it becomes a competition for me you're absolutely right so therefore i guess that's why i enjoyed it so much so you know the classwork was we had like i said good instructors right so the classwork was made easy i understood it 
the report writing and this is what you have to do and practice saying no in the mirror because they're going to come for you. So, yeah, I enjoy my time at the Academy. So now you left the Academy. Mm -hmm. You go into this world, Rikers Island, right? Now, Mm -hmm. I I don't want to go back as far as OJT, but I want to go back to your first command. Now, I met you in 74 RNDC, um, Robert Davern. Now, is that your Originally, only command? Is that what yep, you mean? Yep, A R D C R N D C. That was my that was my one and only original command. Yes. Okay, so you were there for how many years? Twenty three years. Twenty three years. Now, you were not only an officer in R N D C, but you also was a union delegate. Yes. So before we get into the union delegate aspect, let's talk about your career. Day one, walked in the door behind the gate. What was that like for you? Day one, walking in, new experience. um, And I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you I was a little fearful because you don't know really what you're walking into and how to deal and handle with all of it until you learn it. And at that point, there were officers there that were really, really willing to teach you. I don't know why I got stuck in a lot of the adolescence houses houses when I came on, but I was put in Mod 2 and Mod 4 a lot. And the teams of officers that they had working there, they were not only good teachers, but they welcomed you and were willing to teach you as a new officer. Because in 74, you had some that was like, go ahead, get out of here, rookie. (laughs) And then you had those that was really, 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 really willing to teach you. And that's what I found in the officers in that was mod two and mod four upper and lower. Now, I remember, I think when I did OJT, not so much in the latter years, but the the sprungs were open there, right? You had sprungs. Yes. And that's a big facility. It was a lot going on. Because if I'm, were the kids in the sprungs? Is that what it was initially? They had, they had to open up more areas. You had kids in the sprungs. Yes, you did. Okay. But overall... It's politically correct to say RNDC now or is it ARDC? I forgot. RNDC, right? It's RNDC now. Okay. So RNDC is the only, besides the uh, Rose M. Singer that houses the adolescent females, but RNDC is the only facility on Rikers Island that ha- houses adolescent young men. Correct? Yes, that so, is correct. So with that experience in itself, being a mother... How did that affect you possibly mentally, if at all? I looked at it as my, me, myself, I've always wanted to help. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure with the care, custody and control, they got what they were supposed to have. And at some point, some of the young men needed people to talk to. But back then, they didn't know or didn't understand that what that's what it was. Mm-hmm. And if I had a dorm, whereas that's like, you know, they it's it was beds. It wasn't like it was a housing area. It was, you know, open. And the way they would set it up, we would have a table and a chair for our log book and some of them would sit there and just say, I'm in here because my mom needed blah, 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 or my brother was this, that. And they were there, but they needed the help of just talking to somebody. And back then, they didn't have it. So you so, felt like a counselor. You felt like a nurturer. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the sad part is with overtime and being stuck, you need to be home nurturing your own children. But I guess God has a place for all of us. And that was my place. Right. 
at the You're time, absolutely right. at, at the time, oh. especially. So, and, and, and believe it or not, it's not just the adolescents too, because unfortunately as a grown adult, if you don't get the help that you need or the counseling or the services when you're younger, that does transcend into when you become an adult as well. So Mm -hmm. if you didn't catch them as an adolescent and unfortunately they became revolvers, revolving door, you know, people who could just kept coming in and out of the system. At some point you were there to, uh, have a conversation to nurture Mm -hmm. Um, because although sometimes people are grown in age, mentally, they're not. That's correct. So now you're yep. there. You've been working. You worked a lot of time. You worked a lot hands on with the children. But what made you decide that you wanted to become a union delegate? What in you? Because you know they don't really make no extra money. So what was it that you said no? I want to be a union delegate. What sparked that in you? At times, I heard different things that was going on with officers, and. It was brought to me. I didn't think at first about it, but um, I felt I could make a difference. So it was brought to me by the union reps that were there that were about to retire and leave and said, I think this is something that you would be good at. Um, At the time, Officer Robinson that was on the board, he came to me and said, they recommended you for being a delegate. What do you think? I said, I don't know much about it. I can learn, Mm -hmm. but I'm willing to help in whatever way that I can. So he said, okay. So I was appointed. And then from being appointed, I was voted in twice. So when you say twice, how how long is a term for a delegate? Four years. So you were a union delegate in the For 10 years. Wow. That's that. That's quite some time, ma'am. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's a lot of stress. In addition to the work environment you're in, especially because you worked with the kids. So you're, you're a correction officer. You're working in an adolescent environment primarily, and now you've added on union delegate on a day to day for you walking in your worst day ever that you could go back, redo, erase from memory. In, the, in this line of work, what would that be? Mm. An officer was suspended because of what we would call, um, I would say, is it, we would call it an E, or, well, PD calls it like an EDP. Okay. Mm hmm. He had issues. He was in the clinic and he was sent back to the housing officer, housing area by the clinic staff. But he really probably needed to stay in the clinic and talk out with somebody. But whatever happened, he was sent back Mm -hmm. and he killed himself. And it was just so sad because she really it was nothing really that she could have done. And they blamed it on her. And I felt that pain. Like, I felt her pain. Once hearing the story and everything that happened. Mm -hmm. So that bothered me. I hope that the officer definitely got her own uh, mental health issue sorted because I know if she probably you know feeling so much remorse like what if I did this or if I would have done something and people don't understand like we're human so we have empathy we 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 get sad you know that things happen to people and then when it looks like you're the cause of it and people are coming at you and then you're like but this didn't happen and you have all of this remorse and you have all of this Mm -hmm. anger and you don't and you yourself don't have an outlet the same way you, he was sent down to the clinic and they sent him back. What do they mm-hmm. do for the officers? Like, as a delegate, I'm very big on talking about, I know they have, like, care, cope, and all of these things, but there has to be more. And with that being said, I'm going to just speed up and segue into women in correction. Yeah. And, I, and I don't want people to feel that I'm I'm not um, empathetic to the male officers. But 
my primary, I can relate more to women. So guys, please don't be like, ah, she only talks about women. No, this is the life that I led. So I can relate to it. So I don't want you gentlemen to think that I am not relatable to you. I am, but this is just something that I lived personally and can experience and and relate to when I talk to um, other female officers. Now, with that being said, women in corrections, how did it come about? Tell me about that. Okay, women in corrections was formed and started back in 1982. Mm-hmm. And I want to say the women that started that, because I don't have it off the top of my head right here in front of me, was Marie Thompson... Carolyn Cloud, and I want to say a woman named Susan Bishop, if I'm not mistaken. Those are the three true founders that, in doing my research, put it together and started it. Mm -hmm. As time went on, for whatever reason, the the organization stopped and they started it back up in 2015. In 2015, it was brought to my attention that this is an organization and this is what they're doing. Me loving to help people, I said, oh, my God, this is something that I can really, really take on. And now I can really, in even a broader spectrum, other than being just a delegate, now I'm getting to every command and talking to all the women because now they're going to come out to meetings and I can give them my knowledge and what I've learned and rules, regs, report writing, everything. So I said, okay, I want to be a part of it. So I joined in 2015 when it started back up and the different people that were the president, the vice president, the, you know, as it, you know, it goes in ranks. I want to say it started with the vice president. She became an officer. And as a new officer, it was so overwhelming to her. She couldn't stay as vice president. So I started as sergeant at arms. I moved up into the vice president position. And then the president um, of the organization, she ended up um, with a few issues of her own. And as she moved on, then I moved up into that position there. And I've been there (laughs) since, um, I'm going to say 2017. (laughs) And um, we've been trying to get... um, women to come on so that they can learn what we do and we can show them and teach them. We just um, put together a whole new board of active members now that are doing the work in and outside the, outside the jails. We do a lot of volunteer stuff with helping out in the community, again, with the women on the inside because we have so much sexual assault things going on inside we now get people that we can send them to they go to care but we have counselors that will come on and speak at our meetings that we can also recommend them to go to we've looked up you know babysitters because corrections is a 24 7 7 day a week job so a lot of times you need the babysitter that can maybe pick a baby up at the foot of the bridge and we do it as well Mm -hmm. i'll say call me if you know you need somebody and you can't find somebody because the babysitter like they told us in the academy you need a backup babysitter to the backup babysitter to the backup babysitter so we handle that um and again with the just giving advice to what may be going on at home or any type of report writing, women in corrections try to be there, tries to be there. And I know I am, so I can say the same for everybody else because that's you want to group yourself with like minded people, and so far that's what we've done. So, um, the Women in Correction is an organization that's like a fraternal organization, so anyone yes. in the department. They don't necessarily have to be an officer only, but civilians, anyone can be in part of the Women in Correction? That is correct. We're the only female women organization um, that is uh, is recognized by the department. And it's for uniform and non-uniform members, all ranks. 
Uh, that was my next question. Yes. So all ranks in the department can come together and uni- un- unite basically and share their experiences um, and just basically be there for each other in this um, organization. Yes. Excellent. And how do they go about getting this information? Like, is this something, is it really popularized? Like, does is everyone aware that you exist? Like, you know, we, we know about the Guardians. We know about um, the Hispanic Society. Are you feeling like you are getting the reach that is needed throughout the department so that more women can say, hey, I know about this this uh, organization or this fraternal organization. Are you Are you getting the reach that's needed? We're getting the reach, but I'm not going to say we're getting the reach that's really needed. Mm-hmm. We could always reach reach more, always. Um, so what we do is we go out, we'll do things like breakfast for the officers because a lot of the times if they're doing so much overtime, they can't get out in the morning or they can't. So we'll, we've a few times now, breakfast and lunch, set up in the Perry building. And as they came in, just thank them for coming in. And this way we can boost membership by giving them an application and letting them know who we are. So I want to definitely thank the chief for allowing us to do that and, you know, get over there to just say thank you to the officers. So where would they find you? So if they're listening to this now, where would you tell them to go to obtain an application so that they can be a part of this fraternal organization? Well, you can go to New York Women in Corrections at gmail.com. We also have New York Women in Corrections dot org. That's our website. Our website will be up and running really soon. It would it went down so we could revamp it and it could just look amazing. And um, when you reach out to us with our Gmail, you can actually um, get um, us to email you information back more about the organization. We have a Facebook page, Women in Corrections, and we have an Instagram page. And what else do we have? And we have a Twitter page. Okay, so and, t- and Telegram. So we try to hit all the social media's uh, platforms so that people can know what we do. So basically, there's no reason that an officer or any member of the department who is female identifies as female should say, "Hey." I, I can't find you because you're all over the place, right? We're all over the place. <laughs> and we're running into people all the time. And when they have fraternal day at the academy, we go there as well with the new officers and introduce ourselves. That's amazing. So I'm glad that you guys, you know, are putting yourselves out there for the women, especially in this new um and it's probably not even new. It's just probably being spoken about more when it comes to the sexual assault being run rampant through the department. So um, mm-hmm. I'm glad that that is being um, spoken about as well because, you know, people come to work to work, not be, not to um, be sexually assaulted. Exactly. You know, we, we have enough to worry about. So, yeah. Now, just to... We're going to come off of that. So now you're at this place in your life. You're retired. You did 23 years, but you're still in the fight. You're still there grinding for the officers. If somebody asked you, would you do this all over again? What would you say? Absolutely. And that's because I loved what I did. It, you look, it was days that I'd go home crying Everybody would get on my nerves, but I would do it all over again if I had to, because it's the people that you come in contact with that you'd be like, you leave corrections and you still have correction family. That's the truth. So now when you go to the academy now and you have these 
officers coming in before they get to their day zero, day one of the academy, and they they see you, they say, "Hey, Miss Nelson, you know I'm going into the academy tomorrow next week." What advice are you giving the new officers? What are you saying to them? I'm telling them to take their time and learn everything. Don't go in with a "oh, I know this" attitude or an entitled attitude. Because for some reason, our young people of today feel entitled. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, when you go in and you learn every aspect of the job, this way you perform better, you feel better, you do better. Now, is that coming from a place of big um, senior officer or delegate? Is there two sets of rules or two different... uh, uh, statement she would give out like as a delegate prior uh, former delegate is that the same advice or is there something else that you would say with that as well no no because I want to say with me the two ran hand in hand because as an officer you have to know your rules your regs your directives and it's the same thing as a delegate I'm telling you okay if I'm on vacation and you have to go into admin or any of these different places, have a little bit of knowledge. Don't totally depend on me and what I do. Have a little bit of knowledge of what you're walking in on. Mm-hmm. So. Baby, mm-hmm. I just can only imagine because I remember when I used to pass through there, they'd be like, Officer Nelson, Officer Nelson, you could probably, <laughs> you couldn't get nothing done because they was calling you the admin all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because look, I <laughs> believed in fairness. I believed in, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. And uh, yeah, and a lot of the times, the best part of it all is the DWs and admin. Mm-hmm. We respected one another. I could point out things to them, they could point out things to me. Mm-hmm. So it, we had a good um, working relationship with that. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad your 23 years of working with the New York City Department of Correction was satisfying to you. You were able to meet some wonderful people. You enjoyed your job. You had good days. You had bad days. But yet and still, even in retirement, you have um, made it your business to still go back and be a help to those who are coming on as new officers. So we thank you for that. Any last words in regards to the correction portion? Because, you know, we're going to be ready to we take our break and we're going to come back and talk about what I really like to talk about, and that's entrepreneurship. So any last shout-out you want to give to anybody in the DOC spectrum? I just want to thank God for giving me the opportunity because we got to always give God the glory. Amen. And I just want to say, yeah, thanks for my time and corrections. Well, guys, thank you for sticking around. Don't go anywhere because we're going to come right back and we're going to continue to talk to Miss Sharon Nelson, retired New York City Department of Corrections officer, former union delegate, president of the Women in Corrections Fraternal Organization. So right now, go get your coffee, go get your wine, whatever it is that you're going to do, and we'll be right back. This has been brought to you by Simply Carter Corp., your one-stop shop for all of your entertainment and party needs. Contact Simply Carter Corp for any special occasion. You can find them on Facebook at Simply Carter Corp, on Instagram at Simply Carter Corp. You can check out their website at www.simplycartercorp.com. Give them a call at 845 682 0022, or you can shoot them an email at hello at simplycartercorp.com. Simply Carter Corp, a brand for everyone. Welcome back, guys. We're here with former retired New York City Department of Corrections Officer Sharon Nelson. Now, since Sharon has retired, she has said in the prior segment, if you did not catch it, she is a retired officer from tw- of 23 years. She used to be a union delegate, and she is still um, working with the department in the uh, capacity of president of the Women in Corrections Fraternal Organization. However... She is also an entrepreneur. And Sharon, please tell us about 
what it is that you currently do besides all that you do. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I'll tell you about my business, Fam's Catering. I cook a little bit of everything and I love the decoration of chocolate. So with really? Valentine's Day coming up, um, I'm in the kitchen come tomorrow and Wednesday preparing all kinds of chocolate covered strawberries and hearts for people. But I guess that passion um, came from a little girl. I was raised by my um, grandmother and grandfather who my grandfather in the military was the cook or the chef for the cook. I'm going to go with the cook because he had to cook for everybody in the military. So at home on the weekends, we would have so much food. I was like, we can't eat all of this. It was a lot. Mm -hmm. And I just would stand and I would watch him. And it was like something he would just enjoy doing. By coincidence, after time (laughs) working in... um, R A R R N D C seventy four. I was just gonna say, what was your post when you worked? In <laughs> I was gonna R-N-D-C? say I ended up in the mess hall. <laughs> so now, as the supervisor of the kitchen, I'm watching all the cooks, and a lot of the cooks were um, chefs outside, and so they did this on the side. So the managers and everybody knew how to put together something, mm-hmm. and whenever new equipment came in. I had to be there to learn what it is and how to do. So I learned about combi ovens and vats and all kinds of cooking equipment Mm -hmm. and just doing it. I was like, wow, you know, and after a while being in the kitchen, I started cooking for the offices. So now we would do breakfast for fundraisers. We would do black history and I would be overdoing the food. So I said, okay, this is a passion of mine. So when this is all said and done and the people are like, oh, this is good. And that tastes, oh, I like the way you made that. So I said, I can do this. And then it was even better because when I was home and cooking for family on weekends and Thanksgiving, everybody's like, we're going to her house for, we're going to house for food. <laughs> whatever it was, I figured, okay, I got a little skill. I got a little knack here. So I formulated the business and I, it, the business is actually named after my children. And it just so happens that my children names help me to spell out the fam's catering. <laughs> so it means family. So okay. it's the letters of family. And the first is the F, which is Francis. The A is Alvin. The M is Monique. And the S is Sharon. Wow. And I said, I leave that legacy to go on with them and my grandchildren and so I needed to leave. My mind was to leave something behind for them, but I'm also doing something that I'm passionate about, which is cooking. And that's very important, the word that you said, passion, right? Because people go into business a lot of times chasing the dollar to figure out, oh, I'm going to do this to make the money. This is where the money is. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I feel that when you get up and you're doing something that you absolutely are passionate about and that you love, it doesn't feel like work, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it should be a way of uh, also like an outlet. Because if you're working however many hours a day at a job and then you're going into, you know, unless your business is full time and you're doing your business as a side hustle and it's not as uh, rewarding, right? Because you go to work, you're there, then you go to do this other thing. Like... Come on, babe. When are you going to have some fun in your life? Like, do something that's going to make you happy. You can't just always do it for the green. Because if you don't have life experiences, you know, you could become an angel any any day, any second, any hour. We have no Mm -hmm. control over it. That is correct. And you cannot say, oh, I'm going to get to it. Oh, in the next year or so, I'll do it. Oh, right now, I got to get this paper. I got to get this paper. And um, that's not the case. So, guys, if you're listening, live your life, follow your passion. Even if you're not successful right away, it's fine. Like, for you, when you started, it wasn't something that you you set out, oh, I'm going to go and open this catering company. It took some time for you to feel like, hey, this is something I can do. Right. You're correct. Yes. And it doesn't matter if you're not a spring chicken because, you know, I'm knocking up there. (laughs) And... Mm. You know, people say, oh, I'm not that old. But in reality, if you look at the lifespan, right? Typical lifespan is what, 70 something. So like in your 30s, 
you're really middle aged. That's correct. Well, by the time you're 35, you're middle aged. Exactly. <laughs> they're, they're looking at people like, oh, when you're 50, you know, you're middle aged. No. And actually, like you said, 35 is middle age. So you don't have all of the time in the world. You need to do what you want to do. Step out on faith. Try different things. Go different places. Explore different opportunities while you have the chance. Yeah. And that's something you great, great that you just said. You have to step out on faith. If it's something that you're feeling, you have to take a chance with it. If you're passionate about it, you have to take a chance with it. Well, let me tell you something. I appreciate you coming and taking this time with me to talk about not only your experience in correction, but your experience in entrepreneurship. So anything you have, you said, so you're doing the chocolate for Valentine's Day. So Mm -hmm. if anybody wanted to get some chocolate, so actually this is going to air after valentine's day but um you know still give me the information because mother's day will come up there'll be some other holidays but we want to make sure that we support you um so where would they go to how is it done do they book you so is it separate like you do the catering side and then you do the chocolate side like how does how does one contact you for services well you can reach me through facebook and instagram for right now Mm-hmm. Um, my, um, uh, Instagram is million dollar underscore Shay seven. And I also, that's the one that I check a little bit more than my fam's catering run. And I also have the fam's catering Inc. Instagram page that you can find me on. And you can also find me on Facebook. Under what? It's my Facebook. It's under Sharon Nelson. Okay. Well, listen, not everybody <laughs> is techni- technically savvy because, honey, there's sometimes I'd be like, I don't know what I'm doing at all. Thank you. Yes, I'm thank the you. same way. So like, I understood it. You know, uh, if I did not have a virtual assistant at the time, shout out to Kay. Uh, Kay is a virtual assistant. You can find her on Instagram. I mean, on Facebook and Instagram because she is the bomb.com when it comes to virtual assistants. She is the absolute, absolute best. Um, so with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, please make sure you follow this phenomenal woman, uh, Miss Sharon you. Nelson, if you need some treats for upcoming holidays, you may need some, you know, if you have a business and you want to have some stuff done creatively, creatively done for your business, she is the one to reach out to. If you are a current law enforcement uh, officer female and you are looking to be a part of this organization, make sure you reach out, follow her. And if you can't get to her, go into your at. Would they go into their admin's office for applications if they couldn't find it? Is it in the facilities anywhere or no? Yeah, we have. Um, every command has a bulletin board. Where inside that bulletin board, you'll find out information. Okay, so guys, you know, make sure if you're not sure, go find it. Ask someone. Reach out. DM me if necessary. I have applications. I'm always uh, here for you. Um, Sharon, again. I thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Thank again, you. thank you for inviting me on. And you're a phenomenal woman as well. Keep on keeping on because you're doing amazing things. I am truly, truly proud of you. Thank you so, so very much. <laughs> I appreciate you too. And um, we're going to do a lot of things in 2024. So, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Let's get busy. Any last other shout outs now that we've done the we've done the correction shout outs? Any other shout outs to the kids that you want to shout them out? Or I will definitely shout my children <laughs> out. Yes. Alvin, Francis and Monique, I'm shouting y'all out. And I am all my friends that stand behind me and support me and all that I do. I thank all of you. It's too many to name, but they know who they are. And so I just want to say thank you to all of them, family and friends. And thank you. You're welcome. Last question. Something just came to mind really quick. Uh, do you have anything coming up uh, relatively soon prior to uh, this recording, which will be after the Valentine's Day week? Anything that's coming up that you need anyone for uh, fundraisers or anything that you want to announce at this time? Uh, we do have a few fundraisers that are are coming up, but they're pretty much all in the works. Okay. So for anyone that 
follows my page because I try to post everything up. So like I said, if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, um, and for the women that are on the job, New York Women in Correction page, all the information will always be posted there. Okay, great. Well, again, Sharon, thank you so very much for coming to the When the Blue Comes Off family. We look forward to working with you, revisiting all the things that you have coming up soon. And when you're doing something phenomenal with that catering company, we're going to reach out to you because we love to eat over here. Okay. We love, love to eat. love to cook for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, look, and listen, the other thing is I'm also... A certified bartender. So if they need a bartender, I'm next. You should have said that before, cause you know how these you know how these law enforcement people love to drink, girl. Like what's wrong <laughs> with you? You should have said that first. So guys, if you're having a celebration, a party, or something like that, and you need a bartender. I think she just did her own little plug, but make sure you <laughs> shout her out. You need somebody to come through, make them drinks for you. That's the girl to get it done. All right, guys. So don't forget, make sure you tune in. Remember, we revamped the show. So it's every other Thursday on TotalENTRadio.com. But you can always subscribe to my YouTube channel, Simply Carter Corp. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like. Make sure you share. And come back here anytime you want to to catch all of the replays. Thank you so very much and have a wonderful day. I hope you guys enjoyed the show and I look forward to bringing you many more all with positive vibes. Remember, whatever you do, do it from the heart with love and passion. Stay safe. Talk to you soon.